the idea that someone could suggest on air that you might be blown up for supporting the Palestinian people was insane to me. Just weeks before being called a pro-Palestinian Hamas supporting member of Hezbollah, you were attacked for being a pro-Israel apologist. And suddenly I'm an FBI agent, I'm a seller, I'm this and that. That's weird. You didn't say any of that on the day. I would say to you, Rifa, and I've refrained from saying this, but since you brought it up, or maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Butch Ware came on the show. Republicans are cynically playing divide and rule. And I'm saying to people in our community, don't play that game. Donald Trump has gone out of his way to say he is, she is his favorite candidate. Do you think you were in any way possibly gratuitously combative with her in particular? Uh, in the middle of a genocide with a fascist at the doorstep, now is the time to be able to, to say fascist or racist or genocide, the G word. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Muslim Viewpoint, a video podcast series powered by the nonprofit national media platform, American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Rifat Malik, and today we're excited to welcome Mehdi Hassan, a prominent British-American broadcaster and political commentator. Known for his thought-provoking insights and incisive interviewing style, Mehdi is the founder of the independent platform Zateo and previously hosted The Mehdi Hassan Show on Peacock and MSNBC. He joins us today to share his perspectives on key issues ahead of the election next week. Mehdi Hassan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So first of all, I want to ask you how you are after essentially being called a terrorist by a right-wing commentator live on CNN earlier this week. You seemed visibly shocked and understandably angry. Can you give us an idea of what led up to that point and what happened after? Yeah, it was, uh, as I explained on my outlet on Zateo yesterday, on Thursday, I have debated a lot of people over the years, over 25 years as a journalist, 15 years of doing live TV. I've debated people from all walks of life, uh, you know, from the MAGA movement, uh, from Israel, from India, Hamas, the IRA, all sorts of people. Never have I had to walk out of an interview or a discussion live on air, which is what I did on Monday Night. A lot of people don't realize that when they went to break, I was supposed to be there for an hour. I actually couldn't do it anymore. I'm not staying here. I can't be with this guy. Mm -hmm. And I walked out because, you know, I've had abuse thrown at me and the racism wasn't the problem. People said, oh, it's CNN put out a statement River saying this racism is intolerable. The racism wasn't the big problem. I'm used to people going, you know, you're Hamas or you're biased or you're anti-Semitic, whatever nonsense they throw at any mm -hmm. Muslim or any brown person. The idea that someone could suggest on air that you might be blown up for supporting the Palestinian people was insane to me. Like this is this is where we reach now. This is how emboldened the MAGA movement has become in this country, even before their hero has won a second term in office next week, God help us all. And I think that is what was really stunning. And, and something else I said yesterday on Zateo is, you know, we Muslims are not born with thicker skin than everyone else. The idea that we should be able to just take all this stuff that no other community is expected to take. And that's why I appreciated my fellow panelist, Ashley Allison, who's a black woman who was on the panel, stepping up and saying, no, this is ridiculous. I'm, you know, and he said to her, well, I didn't say it to you. And she said, well, I'm offended regardless. And I think that's what mm -hmm. we've forgotten in this country, this idea that we all need to stick with each other against the bigot. Yeah. Well, I noticed that uh, Ryan Gadersky, I don't really want to say his name, but he kind of apologized at the time and then afterwards kind of became emboldened and, and took back the apology. And, and classic, uh, all classic the rest right of winger it. on air runs away, but <laughs> online becomes a keyboard warrior. <laughs> exactly. Well, there's a bit of irony in all this because just weeks before being called a pro Palestinian Hamas supporting member of Hezbollah, you were attacked for being a pro Israel apologist <laughs> by the Green Party's VP pig, Dr. Butch Ware, for your post marking Welcome the first. My Anniversary. world, Rifat. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Who is it? Who am I being attacked by? I was going to say that's quite some straddling that you're doing. He basic for anyone who doesn't know, um, where it basically called you a house N-word, a rat, an FBI informant. I know for a fact that you have been an outspoken critic of Israel for many years and had a lot of backlash because of that. And I know this from way back in England as well. Did that particular attack come left field? A little bit left field, but you know, people, emotions are running high in this election campaign. I look at my Instagram replies or Twitter replies and people are just losing it. And I keep saying to people, I can't wait for this election to be over for many reasons other than the outcome. 
which is, I think it's had a very toxic effect on Muslim and Arab American communities for obvious reasons. People are hurting, people are angry, there is a genocide going on. And in the middle of this genocide, we're being asked to choose between two candidates, both of whom support that genocide. And I think that's a huge problem. And then you have a third party candidate that says we don't support the genocide, but then kind of lie to people and say, if you vote for us, we can stop it, which they can't. So we've got this real problem where there's a mix of hopelessness, powerlessness, uh, anger, frustration, betrayal. I get it. I feel it too. People act like I'm some kind of above the fray. As I, as you saw on Monday night, I'm very much part of this. I, I, I feel it. I, I endure it uh, in, a, in a way that some people can only imagine. But as angry as I am and as upset as I am, I also have to look at facts. I also have to understand how the system works. I also have to understand outcomes. And one thing, one of the reasons I started Zateo when I left MSNBC was to say, look, I don't want to lie to people. I want to be able to say the truth as I see it. I want to say facts as I see it. I don't want to be beholden to corporate boardrooms, corporate advertising, bosses. I don't want to have to you know, follow uh, cautious colleagues who say maybe we should keep our heads down. So, and when I did that, Rifat, people in our community in the Muslim community said, great, we're so happy that you set up an outlet that's truthful. And I, I, we've had so much overwhelming support from the community, both in the US and globally. We have uh, over a quarter of a million subscribers globally. A big chunk of those are Muslims who want a media outlet that is very different to what they're getting. And I appreciate the support. But I would say to the small minority who play this game where if I say something they like, then I'm a hero. If I grill someone they don't like, then I'm a hero. But if I say something they don't like, suddenly I'm a sellout. No, I'm the same person. I say things all the time. You don't have to agree with me. I don't agree with you. Like We can disagree reasonably. What bothers me about our community right now in this election is that there's no sense of good faith disagreement. It's my way or the highway. It's if you don't agree with me, you're pro-Israel, you're pro-Hamas, you're sellout. Blah. There's this constant questioning of each other's intentions. I interviewed an imam from Michigan just yesterday for Zateo, uh, Bilal al-Zuhairi, who endorsed Trump on the debate stage. And we disagreed yeah. ferociously. <laughs> And he's mad at me on Twitter because he didn't like some of my questions about Trump and rape and how we the clip we put out. And the reality is, I respect the imam, right? I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't think he's trying to screw over America or Muslims. I think he's naive. I think he's misguided. I think his judgment's wrong on Trump. But I don't dispute the fact that he's trying to do right by his community and he thinks voting for Trump will do that. Insane, but that's what he thinks. My problem is okay. we don't give that sense of generosity to others around us. We don't say, okay... That person is voting for Harris because they think that's the best way of stopping it. This person's voting for Stein because they think, I just want us to be able to respect each other's choices and accept that a lot of us are struggling in this moment with these horrible choices. And then you get a butch Ware who comes along and pretends it's all easy, vote for the Greens, life will be great. And anyone who opposes me is an FBI seller. I would say to you, Rifa, and I've refrained from saying this, but since you brought it up, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna say it anyways. Butch Ware came on the show. <laughs> butch Ware came on the show, he asked for the interview. I wasn't familiar with Butch Ware, but people told me he's a very respected Muslim scholar. I met him at Isna. He asked to come on the show with Jill Stein. I said, it's going to be a tough interview. He said, we love tough interviews. Not only did they love the tough interview, which she did very badly in. That's not my fault that she couldn't answer a simple question about whether Bashar al-Assad is a war criminal. They left the interview happy. He took a selfie with me on the way out of the door. But suddenly when the interview is an embarrassment for them, then they started attacking me. And suddenly I'm an FBI agent, I'm a seller, and this and that. That's weird. You didn't say any of that on the day. You didn't say any of that when you were leaving. So I find it, you know, and look, they're politicians. This idea that Green, no, sorry to say to your viewers, politicians are politicians, whether you're Green, Democrat, Republican, this is who they are, right? They are cynical folks who need to get votes and will do and say whatever needs to be done to get votes. Don't treat politicians as infallibles or heroes or saints. None of them are, no matter where they are on the spectrum. Well, I've been asked on the subject of the Green Party, on the subject of that interview, which was um, in, in September, I've been asked to ask you a couple of questions from some of their supporters. And there are actually quite a few here in Dallas. <laughs> and as you've rightly said, after the interview, a lot of people were very unhappy. And there were a couple of things that people mentioned to me in particular, and yeah. you've already touched on it, but I'm just going to put it to you anyway. Okay. Number one, I think that the, a number felt that you had kind of unfairly badgered, targeted Jill Stein, uh, pressing her on issues which uh, in fact turned out not to be accurate. Uh, for instance, the uh, pro-Trump post on her IG page, which she said that she had not written uh, or had not liked or whatever. She had in fact condemned both Assad and Putin, maybe not called them war criminals, but she had said that she clearly, you know, um, condemned their actions. Um, you also questioned, you know, why was she standing? And, and I thought that you clarified a point that was confusing maybe for some, that she was a last minute stand-in uh, because Cornell West had backed out. So yeah. in retrospect, do you think i know you said the interview was tough but fair before it yeah. uh, went out but do you think you were in any way um 
you know, possibly gratuitously combative with her in particular. This is hilarious. People have spent years saying they love my interviews because I'm combative, because I, I'm tough. But suddenly, as I say, if I'm tough on someone they like, suddenly it's really bad. I find this so ironic and it's actually really sad to see that actually people don't really respect the journalism I do because it's really just about, oh, they liked it when I was tough on John Bolton or they liked it when I was tough on this or that Democratic congressman. or They liked it when I was tough on this or that Labour Party politician. or They liked it when I was tough on that Israeli. No, I've always been like this. And people who are actually honest about it respect the fact that I've been tough on Palestinian guests and Israeli guests, on Democrats and Republicans and Greens. So, you know, people say, oh, he's never tough on Democrats. I literally did a viral interview with Congressman Dean Phillips where I made him a Democrat sit and watch videos of Gaza's destruction and asked him how he tolerates this stuff. So it's just a lie from uninformed people who say, well, he's not this and that. I told Stein and Ware, you come on the show, I'm going to be tough on you. A, that's my style. B, I have some important questions that you need to answer, answer that you haven't been asked. And C, I don't actually agree with you. It, I'm not hiding it. I think that the Green Party and swing states are going to help Trump. Don't take my word for it. Take Donald Trump's word for it. Donald Trump says that if she runs, she's my favorite candidate because she will help me. Those are Trump's words. But Mithi, what, what about the Green Party in non-swing states? Yeah. Why can't we take I've said this? I've said this publicly, Rifa. Yeah. If you're in a California or a Massachusetts or an Alabama or a Mississippi, vote Green. Stay at home. Vote for whoever the hell you want. It makes no difference. Our system is so dumb and anti-democratic with this dumb electoral college that only a handful of voters and a handful of swing states matter. I've been ultra clear on that. People say, oh, you're anti-Green. I'm not. I actually think the Green Party agenda is great. I said that in the interview. It was a one hour interview. People watch a clip, a clip there. Uh, that's not my issue. By the way, on the factual accuracies, no, I, I'm right. What do you mean that she's condemned Putin's Assad's actions? That wasn't my question. My question was, can you condemn them as war criminals or war, for the war crimes? And she refused to do it, right? I have Green Party supporters who have messaged me saying, it was bad. We support her. She should have been able to answer that question. Mm. Butch Ware looked very uncomfortable sitting next to her. He was able to answer the question clearly. So it's not my fault if she comes on a show and can't be morally consistent and condemn people across the board. On to the other point you made, you said Instagram post. What's the point about Instagram post? We, we asked her why she liked the post. She didn't know why she was liking both. That's not on me. If you have some intern on your team who likes post, that's not my fault. Uh, I, I just get a sense that the Green Party is not some kind of central command. Uh, you know, it's more of a... That was her personal um, Twitter account, Rifa, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm that sure, but she may account. not be handling it. You know, she may have well, some people she, who are... Maybe she should be aware of what's being posted by a presidential candidate. I can assure you, if Kamala Harris liked a tweet saying Trump should be president, that would be a big story. By the way, she went story. on the Breakfast Club that week and she was asked how many members of Congress there are. She couldn't answer that question. Again, I like the Green Party agenda, but don't put up a candidate who doesn't know how many members of Congress there are. Sorry. That's not on me. I, by the way, on, on, uh, Green Party is yeah. in Europe. We're at last point in Green Party. Green Party is in yeah. Europe. Very effective forces. Why is that? They run serious candidates. They have serious programs. In Germany, they're in government. In the UK, they're in parliament. In France, they've had influential roles. Why is it in the US, they have no state lawmakers, no federal lawmakers, no mayors, no governors? Why is it not a serious force in the United States? Is it because it's led by unserious people? As I say, I agree with the agenda. It's the people in charge who maybe need to step aside. Okay, well, on the, you know, the second issue with that interview, just going back to, because I did promise uh, people that I would mention it to you, that you did say oh, well, after the interview, I think you said in another post, that uh, the pair had attacked the Palestinian human rights attorney and academic Noura Arakat uh, during your interview. Uh, but her supporters say that Stein merely mentioned that Arakat's request for them to stand down if, no. if Harris and the Democrats adopted an arms embargo to, against Israel. Uh, that had procedural implications for them as a party. And later, I think in the same interview, she even says that that request wasn't unreasonable. They just couldn't do it. So was it unfair to characterize them as attacking Noura Arakat? Let me say two things to you. Number one, have you watched the interview? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Butch Twice. Ware was very explicit that he was very unhappy with Noura Arakat. Jill Stein, I think, called her naive. I think when you call a law professor and a woman naive about politics when you're the Green Party, yeah, I think that's fair to call that an attack, a criticism. Come on, she, she didn't say the here. word naive. She said that she didn't understand the, the system and she meant the procedural system. I don't think that she meant to say. My understanding she she never is understand that politics. Mean to when say you that she's naive. When you suggest someone is naive about politics, I have to go back and look at the transcript. I think it's very clear to anyone who watched Stein and especially Butch Ware's comments about Nora Erekat. They were very critical. I mean, Nora Erekat can speak for herself. And by the way, she has spoken for herself. She's put out a bunch of tweets, uh, which she didn't want to put out about the Green Party because 
they said some stuff she didn't agree with. I mean, talk to Nora Erica, get her on the show, see what she thinks about the Green Party. I think she well, can speak for on, on that very I'm point about Nora. Nora. Yeah, on the point that Nora Erica, Erica asked Nora Erica asked for uh, about the Green Party giving way or lying down on their sword for the greater good, i.e., to get Harris elected and stop dividing the yeah. anti-Trump vote. Is it right to ask that of a political party that's been around for forty years? Great. I know you say they've not been effectual compared to other parties, but they've still been using their presence to leverage pressure on the main two parties for for progressive issues, which you acknowledge. And isn't it exactly what they've done on the issue of Gaza? The Democrats are trying to stop votes hemorrhaging to the Greens, and that's because and, and appease some of the pro-Palestinian voices within the party and among the electorate, and that's directly because of the Greens. So I think the Democrats have not actually done enough on Gaza. I think the Democrats have been an embarrassing failure on Gaza. I think this week they look like they want to lose Michigan, sending Bill Clinton to make stupid, racist, patronizing remarks in Michigan. I think the Democrats have been awful on Gaza. Let me just make that clear to everyone watching. That's a separate argument about how bad the Democrats have been on Gaza. To go back to this green issue, I actually think you make a very good point. No, in a, in a, in a, in, you're right in a sense. And Butch West said this in the interview. He actually said this very openly, and I'm glad he said it. He said... You can't expect the Green Party to step aside because of genocide. It's, we're not just campaigning on Gaza. Thank you for being honest, right? The problem is, Rifat, is that they're doing two things at one time. They're saying, vote. we are the anti-genocide party. We're the ones who will stop the genocide. But then they're also saying, but hold on, we're the Green Party. We have many other issues we care about too, which is totally, I respect that. But you can't have it both ways. If genocide is your number one issue, if that's how you're cynically attracting lots of Muslim voters who are rightly fed up with the Republicans, Democrats, then yes, when someone like Nora Erika or someone else makes the point that if you get what you want on Gaza, then you can't carry on running. It doesn't make any sense, River. Let's just talk this through. You're saying that you must give us an arms embargo and a ceasefire deal. And by the way, this is a Friday before the election. Every, it's too late. That ship has sailed. So, but yeah. let's talk about when this happened in September. The argument was that we need the Democrats to give us what we want. So I said to Jill Stein, if they give you what you want, will you step aside? That's the logic, right, River? You can't have it both ways. If you're saying to the Democrats, we need you to do this, otherwise we're all going to vote green, then once they give you what you want, then you can't still undermine them. That's just, a, that's how a bargain works. Well, I think Jill's point was that they don't need to step aside, maybe because people will, if they give the arms embargo, agree, if they had agreed to it, then Doesn't people would vote Jill for them. would have to endorse them and say, actually, lesser of two evil, which she never does. I interviewed her in 2016, and I said to her in 2016, in Pennsylvania, Trump Clinton, if somebody says to you, a green voter, less, who do I do? You can't win here. Who do I pick? And she said, no, they're both the same. That is fundamentally dishonest. That line that Stein pushes, and it's okay, actually um, worse than saying that. Um, it's very clear the Greens are simply earlier, anti -democrat. You've come I asked you this question too. You saw the interview. If you're fire. really a third party, shouldn't you be against both parties? I only ever hear them say abandon Harris, abandon Harris. Do you ever hear anyone say abandon Trump? I've never heard Jill Stein say abandon Trump. Mehdi, I think that's presumed. <laughs> they no, have absolutely no trouble well, with Trump. Let me tell your viewers who may not know this, Republicans are helping the Green Party. Just today, CNN's yeah. reporting that robocalls in Michigan are going out, telling people to vote for Stein. They're paid for the Republicans. In certain states where Stein has tried to get on the ballot, Republican lawyers have helped her do that. Donald Trump has gone out of his way to say he is, she is his favorite candidate. There's a reason for this, guys. Please don't be naive. The Republican Party very much understand that Jill Stein being on the ballot helps Donald Trump. That is just a mathematical fact. And by the same token, Mehdi, uh, Democratic lawyers have been trying to get them off ballots and they've been yeah. doing everything they can to stop them being so. It, the it really the also begs the question. Democratic lawyers are trying to get them off the ballot to protect themselves. Republicans are cynically playing divide and rule. And I'm saying to people in our community, don't play that game. Well, I mean, I think that, that Stein did say in the interview that obviously she did, uh, would not ask anyone to support um, but Trump. Support. But their argument is that the, I think it was something that the, the devil you know uh, was, you know, the kind of parallel that the analogy they were using. But clearly, you know, the Democrats uh, are a party that Muslims have traditionally voted for. Over something like 65% of Muslims vote for the Democrats. But when the party that you support doesn't even allow you to come on, uh, you know, the DNC uh, center the stage, why should you vote for them? Why do they have an automatic right to your vote just because who you're says, afraid of, uh, of Trump and the alternative? Who says they have an automatic right to your vote? Well, they feel they do. Isn't that the, there's a but presumption that we have Democrats. to vote Democrats? I've never said that, but I don't speak for the Democrats. I've never said that. I mean, obviously, that is something that th it, there is a sense out there that Democrats do feel that they should. I mean, I was interviewing uh, Congressman Adam Smith yesterday, uh, yeah. the, the ranking member of the House. I think it's the Arms, Armed Services Committee. Exactly. And he was saying that, you know, uh, well, you know, your your viewers uh, can go and vote for Trump. They'll, they'll be sorry. It'll, it'll, you know, how can they do that? And, and he seemed very to me, he came across as quite arrogant. Yeah. 
And I, agree you know, with uh, I think they're handling the campaign horribly, but, but yeah. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. And unfortunately, too many in our community seem unable to do this. I can say the Democrats are complicit in genocide and war crimes. Kamala Harris is awful on Gaza. And the Democrats' strategy of trying to win back Muslim and Arab voters from the Greens or from the couch in places like Michigan is awful. Bill Clinton is patronizing. Adam Smith, you're saying, is patronizing. I get all that. I can say all that. And at the same time, I can also say that it is undeniably true that Donald Trump will be worse for Muslims, worse for the climate, worse for the planet, worse for American democracy, worse for undocumented immigrants. I'm not sure why we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. We, we're in this insane position where we're so obsessed with the Democrats, which I get, they're in office, they're doing the genocide, that we're giving Trump a pass. We're acting like on, you know, people say we're going to defeat Harris and Michigan. Okay, let's, let's just game that out. Harris loses Michigan. She deserves to lose Michigan. Let me put that on the clue. She deserves. They run such a bad campaign, they deserve to lose Michigan. Let's say she loses the election after losing Michigan. Not necessarily, but she does. Okay, then what? Have you? I've not heard Green Party voters or Muslim voters tell me. What's the plan on January 20th when Trump's president? What's the plan on 21st and 22nd? How are Palestinians in Gaza safer on the 25th or 26th of January? How are Muslims in America better off on the 1st or 2nd of February? I've not heard anyone engage with that. And I find that to be disingenuous. I find that to be uh, reckless. I find that to be naive. I find that to be self-harming. Don't shoot me because I'm the guy saying, guys, all right, Harris loses. She deserves to lose. What happens under Trump? And I would respect people if they said, you know what? Trump's worse, but I don't care. I want to punish Harris. I respect that view. At least it's an honest view. What I don't respect is the view that says, well, maybe Trump's not that bad. Maybe they're as equal as each other. That's just dishonest. That is idiotic. And that's something I'm not going to let go because you know what? I know Americans have the memories of goldfish and they can't remember anything that happened beyond last week. But sorry, I remember the Trump presidency. I remember 200,000 people who died from COVID who didn't need to die, according to the Lancet Commission. I remember him uh, joining with MBS to help kill 30, 40,000 Yemenis. I remember him moving the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. I remember him saying hor horrifically anti-Muslim things. I remember him separating children from their parents in what psychologists call torture at the border. I'm not just going to erase that because and I'm mad. Muslim ban. Yeah, you don't yeah. even need to get to the Muslim ban. People say, well, I hear people say, well, Muslim ban or genocide, as if Trump only did the Muslim ban. No, Trump would be doing genocide too. Trump said two weeks ago, Rifa, Biden has restrained Netanyahu and Netanyahu should not listen to him. He should be doing more. The guy is saying it out loud that if I'm president, Netanyahu will have even more freedom to kill Palestinians. And I have people in our community say, well, we don't know what Trump presidency would be like. Yes, we do. Stop lying to yourselves. I just want to ask, just really just stop and be reflective for, for a moment, if you will. Like I said, you've been under fire for, for many quarters because you came uh, out backing Harris. And that's why you've had this huge backup. Got, I keep, I keep saying this. I've been all Harris. Nowhere. You, in yeah, no, no, well, let me qualify that. I'm going to finish my yeah. sentence. I'm 2024 because I'm really tired of this, especially for Muslim yeah. imams making videos just lying. No point in 2024 did I tell anyone to vote for Harris. Not once. People have asked me what I think about the election and I tell them how I see it. I have said that Donald Trump should not be president. Mm -hmm. Right, right. OK, well, well, but you have said that, well, obviously for him not to be president, we have to vote for Harris, right? Well, that's interesting because I'm the one pointing out that there is a choice. It's not, Muslims are the ones acting like voting, not voting for Harris doesn't give us Trump. It does. Yeah. And by the way, again, we collectively, only if you live in Michigan or Pennsylvania or Georgia, do you have to make these choices. Most Muslims do yeah. not live in those states and therefore can vote however they like. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was what, what I was really going to say to you was that, you know, just even, um, you know, saying that Muslims, you're not telling them where to vote. Obviously, you made that clear in, in a number of your posts. But you're just saying that to stop Trump, obviously, you know, that there, there is one way to stop Trump and it would be to vote for the Democrats. But I wanted to ask you as someone who, again, I've read so much of your work on um, Gaza and, yeah. and, and your criticism of, uh, of Israel. And I just wondered if it was it was really hard to do that in this situation where we have the one of the most horrific genocides, you know, yes. in our, you know, in our rooms, in our on our yes. TVs every day. I mean, it's been it's been deeply, deeply traumatic. And I just wondered how hard it is for you to, to make that choice in that context. The choice about covering us. The choice about saying that, you know, to stop Trump, we have to vote for oh, because the Harris ticket has been presiding over the genocide. It's horrific. I was at the DNC. I was furious at what they did to Ruhr Rahman and Palestinian voices. This Democratic Party is clearly anti-Palestinian from the leadership. It's clearly uh, been, uh, you know, indulging in all sorts of uh, horrible 
um, act in Gaza. I've been very clear about that. I have said, I'm the guy who wrote my first Guardian piece after leaving the MSNBC saying Joe Biden is complicit in a genocide. He needs to stop it with a phone call, right? I'm the guy who said Kamala Harris needs to break with Joe Biden on Gaza. I've spent much of the year on Zateo platforming Palestinian voices out of the West Bank and Gaza, calling attention to the genocide. I've literally, as you say, had a death threat on live TV because I said I support Palestinian rights. So it's funny when some people, activists online are like, oh, you're not pro-Palestinian enough or whatever it is. I'm not going to play people's purity tests. I would push back on the premise of your question. I think you and I are very honest online people. And one thing I've noticed this year is the internet isn't real life. And I say that as someone who's addicted to Twitter and whose wife wishes I was not on, online all the time. Uh, the reality is I've spent this year traveling around the US. I've gone to California. I've gone to Illinois. I've gone to Georgia. I've gone to Pennsylvania. I've gone to New York and New Jersey, all over the place. I've spoken to packed crowds. One thing I realize is the internet isn't real life. What freaks are saying online is not necessarily what real people are saying. So when you say you've got a lot of criticism, yeah, I've got a lot of criticism from a small group of activists and click hungry imams uh, who really want to just use me to kind of get attention and attack me. Even though when I go out in the world, I meet Palestinian activists on the ground who say, thank God for having been the only voice on MSNBC who said genocide. Thank God for having set up a media company that now gives an alternative perspective on what's happening on Gaza, a factual perspective on what's happening on Gaza. So that actually fills me with much more confidence and appreciation for our community than the toxic battles that are happening online. I mean, Butch Ware uh, wants to attack me. Great. Most people say to me, and Ilhan Omar, I asked Ilhan Omar, what do you think about Butch Ware? And she said, who is he? So I think that's the reality of the world we live in, right? The online Instagram battles is not real life. I appreciate the massive support that Zateo is getting for the journalism that we're doing. We just won uh, the best new podcast at the Signal Awards, uh, We're Not Kidding, which has been devoted to Gaza uh, with Bassem Youssef and Riz Ahmed and that's some great guest hosts. So um, I just find it hilarious. What you know, I interviewed John Legend, Rifat, and he talked mm -hmm. for the first time about the need for an arms embargo and why he wants Harris uh, to treat Palestinian children as human beings. Really powerful interview. I remember that went out the same day that went out some rando activist was attacking me as being pro-Israel. I'm like, this is insane, right? We have an A-list celebrity on Zateo saying what we want, like giving Palestinians a platform. And yet this is the kind of crazy yeah. internet in battles that are going. That's why I need the election to be over. Our community has become so divided, so toxic, so yeah. turned on itself. Meanwhile, Netanyahu and Ben Gavir and Donald Trump and Elon Musk are just running away with it with no one holding them to account. I hear very few people in our community talking about Elon Musk's toxic role on Gaza. We would much rather police each other and attack each other than deal with the actual threats to our free speech, to the future of the Palestinians, to our democracy in this country. Big picture, folks, big picture. I want to talk for a moment about Zatea, which you mentioned earlier. It's uh, obviously been hugely successful. You have over 30,000 paid subscribers. Uh, and you, as you mentioned earlier, you started it soon after MSNBC, uh, your MSNBC sh show was cancelled last November. Um, and I want to talk about that for a moment. Uh, that came as a shock, I think, to a lot of people. And it was also reported at the time that you and two other Muslim presenters at the network had simultaneously been taken off air in the wake of October the 7th. I wanted to ask you, and I I think you did kind of touch on it obliquely earlier, but did you feel the pressure of censorship at any time while at the network, particularly on the issue of Gaza and Israel? Wherever I've worked, Rifat, and I've worked at the BBC, I've worked at Sky News, I've worked at Al Jazeera English, I've worked at The Intercept, I've worked at uh, MSNBC. One of the reasons I set up Zetero is because wherever you work, you are fundamentally an employee. It's not about censorship or not censorship. It's about the fact that you're never going to have the full freedom to say what you want to say unless you have your own platform. And that was a blessing uh, from God that I was able to leave MSNBC and I have a following that I've built up over the years, a global following and an American following that allowed me uh, to set up a media company from scratch and, you know, become self-sufficient quite quickly. And as you say, have close to 40,000 paid subscribers, uh, almost 300,000 subscribers globally. We already did a documentary, which we never thought we'd do in year one. We were able to afford to pay for a, a documentary about Gaza, which is, I urge people to watch, Israel's real extremism. And that is because, yes, I wanted to get to a point, I'm 45 years old, I've worked my whole life in the bosom of corporate media on both sides of the Atlantic. And I thought, you know what, if not now, when? When am I going to do my own thing? Uh, in the middle of a genocide with a fascist at the doorstep at home, now is the time to be able to, to say fascist, uh, which a lot of people in American media run away from saying about Donald Trump, or racist, they won't call him racist, so he's racially insensitive, or genocide, yeah. the G word, which we know the New York Times and other publications have said, please don't say this to their staff internally. Yeah. So clearly there's a freedom issue. Um, you know, that has always been a case. Um, as for why MSNBC canceled my shows, you'd have to ask them. I was very outspoken on Gaza for all of the three and, three and a half years on the West Bank, on Israel, for all of the three and a half years I was at MSNBC. People sometimes say, oh, you went and joined corporate media. And I always say, well, show me what I 
did or didn't say on corporate media that was different to what I said at Al Jazeera or The Intercept uh, or The Guardian. Uh, my views have always been consistent. I've never allowed anyone to silence me. And uh, you'd have to ask MSNBC about censorship or what they do or do allow their hosts to say. I've always said what I wanted to say. Well, I, I, again, you also touched on this earlier as well. You, what we were talking about, I, I mean, tell me, are there any other Muslim commentators out there right now uh, in the mainstream? I can't think of anyone other than you right now who's talking uh, as a guest, obviously. I mean, so yesterday, Joy Reid, my good friend, Joy Reid at MSNBC, who's been fantastic on this topic, one of the great outspoken voices on human rights and justice consistently across the board. Uh, she hosted a great panel discussion with uh, Zateo contributor Rula Jibril and my good friend Wajad Ali. So we had two great Muslim voices on one Palestinian American. And, you know, there are voices out there. It's just are they getting the platforms they need? And we know this, Rafa, you know this, that mainstream media does not platform Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, pro-Palestinian voices in the same way that they platform Israeli voices, pro-Israeli voices, uh, military industrial And do you think, yeah, and, and do you think that is the reason why we've seen, because of this lack of, you know, diverse voices, is that why we're seeing the kind of exponential growth in independent platforms by journalists like yourself and other influencers yeah. who are going directly to audiences through yes. social media? 100%. But I would say I'm not one of these people who says burn down the media and just have independent media because that doesn't make sense. You need to reach audiences where they are. And there are audiences watching MSNBC and CNN, and you need to reach those audiences. So am I glad that Eamon Moyoudin still has a show on Sunday night and Saturday night? Yes, I am. He's a fantastic host who platforms Palestinian voices, platforms doctors who've been out to Gaza, platforms human rights activists in a way that other hosts may not. Am I glad Ali Velshi has a show there? Yes, I am. Um, so I think we have to understand, I've always been insider and outsider. In fact, my entire career is insider, outsider. I've had one foot inside, one foot outside. I've always been the guy on Zateo critiquing the media, but I've also been the guy on the media critiquing the media from within the media. And I'm proud of that. And I think we always have to have an insider outsider strategy. People who say we just need to be inside and don't criticize anything from outside, that's naive. And people who say we just need to be on the outside shouting and throwing rocks, that doesn't also get us anywhere. You need both. And I think that's, you know, Zateo is very proud of the fact that we have an uh, independent platform. We're able to say what we want to say, put out documentaries slamming Israel, uh, you know, not have to worry about censorship. But at the same time, I do go on cable channels to talk about what's going on. We do have contributors like John Harwood, who's more liberal left, like Naomi Kleinman, who's more left left. We have the range. So we're very clear about wanting to reach audiences where they are, having wide audiences. My worry is as people go independent, they think you just go niche. They think you just cater to one small uh, or group. And I get that from a financial perspective, but that doesn't really help you if you're just preaching to the converted, if you're just talking to one small group. And by the way, you become in hoc to those groups. You say, well, we're independent, but you're not really independent. And to go back to your earlier question about the Green Party and people being mad at me, some people being mad at me, my position is this, right? I did not leave MSNBC and strike out on my own to go, oh, wait, I better be nice to the Greens, otherwise I'll lose subscribers. If that's what, you know, that's not who I am. Right. If I do journalism and I say what I think, and if that costs me a subscriber, oh, well, the whole reason is that I am who I am because I stick to my principles. It's not about trying to win people over or have fans or build big followings. It's about doing the right thing. Now, if that helps, if a big following comes along with that, great. But that's not the purpose of what I do. I've got a final question for you, Mehdi. In September, you appeared on Open to Debate with the uh, housewife favorite, Elon Levi, and being <laughs> facetious, who for anyone who doesn't know is a particularly obsequious former British Israeli spokesman or apologist. And there was this really nauseatingly performative moment when Levi approached you with a pin in support yes. of Israeli hostages and challenged you to wear it. Now, as the author of the best-selling book, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking, for anyone who didn't see it, can you tell us what your reaction was and what thinking process guided how you dealt with that situation, which was clearly planned, obviously. Oh, clearly planned. Uh, he came with a prop in violation of all the rules that were agreed beforehand, just like TV debates. We had rules for this debate. And there was a moment where he stuck his hand in his pocket. I'll be honest. I was like, for a moment, <laughs> paranoid person is like, what's coming out of that pocket? I'm on stage. Yeah. With with a former Israeli spokesman. You know, I do, I would be insane if I didn't worry about my security in these situations, especially after mm -hmm. Monday. But he pulls out this pin, he strides across the stage, which goes against the rules. The moderator does not stop him from crossing the stage. He gives me this pin to put it on, his little crowd in the audience cheers and whoops, because the racist assumption is that I'm anti-hostage. I'm not. From the very beginning, I've condemned Hamas. People have been upset with me in activist circles because I condemned Hamas for taking children hostages, completely in violation of international law and Islamic law. And, uh, I said to him, and I walked back across the stage. I said, we want to play stunts? Let's do stunts. So I walked back across the stage and said, I will put this pin on if we say release all the hostages, release Palestinian hostages. And I knew he would say, well, there was a terrorist, I had Palestinian children, that just the Palestinian children in detention, call for their release. 
will you do that? And he wouldn't do it. And I said, well, there you go. There's your answer. I'm willing to put this on right now if we're consistent, not if we play a selective game of outrage, which is what the Israelis do. Um, and he, funnily enough, Rifat, edited that clip and put it out on Twitter with just him giving the pin. <laughs> I then quote tweeted him and put out the full clip with my response. By the way, as a lot of people pointed out, the moderator didn't do anything when he walked over to me and gave me the pin. When I walked over to give him the pin, the moderator walked up and backed me away. Funny that. I noticed. Man going over to the white guy, but the white guy could come over yeah. to the brown man. I noticed that. Little, little subliminal things that we notice. Yeah, yeah. No, and there were a few other, you know, comments that I think he directed more towards you, even though uh, I felt that Levi was interrupting far more than you were. So I definitely well, there was a great moment. That. There was a great moment which really comes down to the art of debate and understanding why our media is so broken in this country when we talk about both sides, both sides. We, we, we equate Trump the fascist with you know, the ordinary politician we don't like. We equate the people doing genocide with the people objecting to it. There's a great moment where in the opening remarks, randomly, right at the top, Adon Levy turned and said, Mr. Hassan is a liar and he's liars. And then just gratuitously and then walked off. And the moderator goes, that's not how we want to conduct the debate. I hope we won't accuse each other of lying. I then went up and said, Elon Levy said babies were beheaded. He said babies were baked in ovens. The tweets are still up. So how can you trust anything he says tonight? And the moderator says, I asked you both not to call each other liars. That's not the same thing. He accused me of being a liar gratuitously. I brought receipts as to why he shouldn't be trusted. They're not the same. But this is the both sidesism in our media that destroys people's faith in our media. And, it's one of the and the double standards as well. Mehdi, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to our audience. And good luck with Zateo and uh, all your future endeavors.